No matter if points are gained or points are lost, there will be much to discuss. For analysis regarding tonight's Winnipeg Jets game, here are Dave Manouk, Ezra Ginsberg, and your host, Drew Mendel. The Illegal Curve post-game show starts now. Good evening, Winnipeg. Good evening, Manitoba. For all those joining us live on our YouTube channel and all of our social media platforms, including our Instagram feed, we say good evening, universe, and welcome to the Illegal Curve post-game show. Along with Dave Manuk, I'm your host, Drew Mandel, here to discuss a poor performance by the Winnipeg Jets, losing on home ice 4-2 to two to a really a better prepared, more involved Nashville Predators team, a Predators team that has been, I don't even, it's more than on fire. So whatever is more than on fire, uh, you know, can be used to describe this Predators team as red hot, red hot, white, red, red, Drew, red hot. 10, 0 and 2, if I'm not mistaken. 11, 11 with tonight's win. There you go. 11 0 and 2 in their last 13 games. Uh, they are firmly in a playoff spot. I mean, theoretically, they are only seven points behind the Jets and the Colorado <laughs> Avalanche uh, for second and third spot in the Central Division. Um, look, you knew, Dave, that when Mark Shifley was announced as a scratch, which sort of came out of nowhere right during uh, the. Uh, Due to illness. Yeah, doing ill due to illness during the pregame warm-up that uh, this was going to be a bit of an uphill battle for the Winnipeg Jets. But nonetheless, I think you really are concerned with the response or lack thereof that the Jets had with Shifley being out of the lineup and how dominant Nashville was in the course of tonight's game. I, I go back to... Uh, Monday's post-game show after the Jets controlled the game against the Washington Capitals and beat up on a you know not very good Washington Capitals team. And I said Wednesday's game was going to be about Nashville wanting to remind the top three teams in the Central Division, the Jets, the Stars, and the Avalanche, that they want to be in the same breath of those three teams. Well, based on tonight's performance by the Predators, you can't talk about the Stars, the Avs, the Jets without mentioning the Predators as being just as big of a threat um, the way they really controlled tonight's game. Yeah, I think that's probably a pretty good assessment there, Drew, because, I mean, it's interesting. We talk about Nashville and everybody kind of, thinks and forgets about them that's a that's a very good hockey team and it's a well coached hockey team they're a disciplined hockey team they're an aggressive tenacious hockey team I mean they did a lot of good things and they've been doing a lot of good things and let's not forget I'm not going to make this about the AHL right now but their AHL club who have hit a bit of a skid because some of their players are now up in the NHL but their AHL club went 19 straight games without a loss in January and February they didn't lose a game till the end of February now they're, they hit a bit of a skid, including today's 6 nothing loss to the Manitoba Moose. But the point is, since February 17th now, mm -hmm. it's almost coinciding, the Nashville Predators have taken caught fire that their AHL club had, Drew, and they've gone for it. And it, again, they're reminding, remember, everybody was talking about the Predators as sellers. What are the Predators going to be? Are they going to be sellers? Well, they're clearly, they weren't sellers. They, you know, traded for Jason Zucker in a, in not a significant move, but they didn't sell some of the assets that some folks thought they may. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've played very good hockey. They're, they're again, they're, they're fairly disciplined. They play a really tenacious style. Yeah. And I just, again, up and down the lineup, you've got guys who like, you know, uh, Philip Forsberg's phenomenal Roman Yossi. Yeah. Again, he doesn't get a lot of uh, attention because he's in Nashville. And, and I think everyone's so used to, to sure. see, used to him doing what he does. So yeah. you know, he's not the he's not the exciting, flashy new new toy. He's just so damn consistent and so damn good at it, and been doing oh. it at such a high level for so long that you yeah. begin to take it for granted. Yeah, exactly. And that's and that's what I was going to say is that you just watch him and you're just like, this guy is phenomenal. And his passes, like the first two goals of the game, were courtesy of his abilities. And yeah. so. You know, I mean, again, you. I don't think that the Jets. It's the second game in a row now where they they've started with that second line, and the team opened up with a very good chance against. And you know, Connor Hellebuck made the save, but you kind of thought to yourself, well, why is it that the Jets are getting pressed that quickly in their home building when they're choosing the matchup? 
And again, it's the second straight game where they went with the, with that second line. But, you know, it's just one of those situations, Drew, where you were curious to see how would the Jets handle it? Because, you know, people want to say Washington's not a very good team. They're not a great team, but they were hot and they were desperate. The Predators are just hot and they're a good team. So I wanted to see how the Jets would match up. And would they be able to, you know, really offset what Nashville would, you know, Nashville's going to try and come in and impose their game. Well, the Jets are the home team. Mm-hmm. Jets have played better, uh, you know, two of their last three games, they have shutouts. So you're wondering, are you going to get the Seattle game? Are you going to get the Washington game? Or are you going to get the Vancouver game? Right. And, and, you know, obviously losing Mark Shifley is a, is a massive situation for the Jets. You can't underscore it. He is the most important player on this team from a scoring perspective. He's right. the driver. Right. And so without him, with all due respect to Vlad Nemesnikov, who remember was not even taking faceoffs in the last game because he's got a bum thumb, according to the head coach, he's now your top line center. So that's an unfortunate situation, of course. And yeah, I mean, like I said, it's just the illness is clearly, you know, what we're hearing is that they're still dealing with illness. Mm-hmm. It's this mystery illness the, through the, lo- the longest, the longest flu but, bug to ever live. Well, it is. And and I, and again, I, I was saying this to you before we started the show, but it's just, it, to me, it's interesting. And again, we're not here to make excuses for the jets, but you know, Nate Schmidt was so sick in Buffalo, but then they had him out on the, and so he didn't play in that game. What was the Tuesday game that they played? Was that St. Louis? No. Uh, I, I Whoever they played exactly after Buffalo remember. on the Tuesday here in Winnipeg, but Nate Schmidt was out on the ice. In Wasn't that, that was Seattle. That was Seattle. If I'm not Seattle. Wrong. Yeah. So, so, but the point I'm making is that you have guys who are not feeling well, including Mark Shifley. Like Mark, it was weird because I was at morning skate today and Mark Shifley was late coming on the ice late for him. Like it was probably right, right around nine 30, mm-hmm. but he's usually one of the first guys out there. So when Mark Shifley was a little bit late, I was like, well, that's kind of weird because originally I was thinking he wasn't even going to be out on the ice. Then you see him and I'm like, okay, well he's there. But to me, uh, if you've got Mark Shifley and he's not playing tonight because he's, he's ill, then he probably shouldn't be on the ice because all those guys are in close proximity. So you're, you're potentially uh, exacerbating the problem. And like I said, you hear that now that there's a number of guys who are dealing with illness and but again, like I said, it's inconsistent because you had a, the performance you had against yeah. the Washington Capitals. So that to me is why it's, you know, it's easy to say, well, there's illness, but there was an illness when you beat Washington. There was an illness when you beat Seattle, but somehow the illness is only skipping every second game now. Apparently, <laughs> the illness, the illness only comes around when the Jets play poorly. That seems, yeah. that, you know, you're saying that's a little bit suspicious right there. Look, but, even, but just, I will say quickly, just sorry, Drew, just last yeah. thing. It, I mean, Vlad Nemestikov left in the second period for a couple of shifts, nothing happened to him. So it could be that he was not feeling well and had to go to the room. So it is possible that it is impacting the team right now, but I'm just saying that it's just, you know, it's just curious how it seems to be uh, kind of every second game as opposed to consistent. Well, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, the competition. And I mean, it's a fair stat. And our buddy Scott Billick was, was talking about it uh, earlier today and wrote about it. I mean, against playoff teams since Christmas, I think the Jets with the loss tonight dropped to three wins in 11 games. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that is a bit of a troubling statistic. The Jets are still cleaning up for the most part against the lesser weights. Uh, in the league, and and you certainly look, you 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 play the games against the teams that are in front of you, and so you don't have to apologize if you beat up on those bad teams. Because remember, last year the Jets had some trouble with those bad teams. Mm-hmm. But you know, ultimately, push comes to shove, you'll you're going to be evaluated on how you play against the better teams come playoff time. You know, on Friday when you have Anaheim in town, well, guess what? There's no Anaheim's come playoff time. There's no Washington's come playoff time. There's no, yeah, you lost one game against them, but there's no Seattle's come playoff time. So you do need to match up against these teams. And, you know, it, 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 it's fair also to point out that the Jets were not at full strength tonight. They were not, they really haven't yet really been at full strength since the trade deadline, of course. Yeah, two thirds of your top line. Yeah, you know, because Velarde's been out of the lineup still. So all these things are fair commentary, but at the same time, there are some troubling signs that, you know, you hope or that Jets fans hope are more aberrations than anything else. And you want to see this team, you know, back together and you want to see this team uh you know uh here comes the Jets head coach Rick Bona so we're going to go to his comments Rick what was missing from the team game tonight uh a lot you know the execution wasn't there um face off readiness you know they were jumping by us we were winning draws and getting ourselves in trouble so the execution just was was way off from the, from the start 
Anything stand out about their game? Obviously, they're the hottest team in the NHL yeah, right yeah. now. Yeah, give them credit. They played a great game. They came at us, and they, they we know that. We talked about it before the game. That, and, you know, they had points in 12 straight games, so um, we knew what to expect. How do you get the execution cleaned up at this time of year? Is it just a matter of the games are going to be like that? Yeah, we need to practice tomorrow. We'll have a good practice tomorrow and start with that. What did you think of Kyle uh, with, with uh, Sean and Tyler when you had them there together at times? Yeah, well, it's, it's hard to judge. I mean, everything was off, so it's hard to it's hard to judge that. One of the players was asked uh, sort of what your message was for them after the game. I guess the sense is it wasn't a strong game. They said that you hadn't been in there yet. No, I'll deal with it tomorrow. And sometimes, you know, the players can speak up. It doesn't always have to come from the coach. So, well, I'll deal with it tomorrow. Is that an art of coaching thing? You think that they're just they're they're going to hold each other accountable now? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, this group cares. It's a good team. It, we, they do care an awful lot. So we, we are way off tonight. So um, there's only so much I can go in there and say, So, but we'll deal with it tomorrow. Um, some fans are getting a little tough on Connor Hellebuck. It looked like the shots that he faced were pretty oh, tough. So. He was the least of our concerns tonight. He, he kept it close. He kept us in the game to give us a chance. Mark Yeah. Vladdy went in at one point during the second. Was that yeah. injury related or flu related? Uh, no, just injury. He just got banged up a little. Sorry, I know you weren't the biggest fan of the, the, the first Seattle game and then the Vancouver game and now. Um, and the game sandwiched in between were really good ones. Any ideas what's leading to the kind of flip flop and consistency? Yeah, a little bit. Anything Not going to share can... with you. Huh? Fair enough. Good try. <laughs> Thank you. There he goes, quick, short, and sweet. The Jets head coach, Rick Bonus, uh, did not want to spend any more time than absolutely required behind uh, the microphone tonight in, in addressing the Jets' performance. Uh, interesting that he hasn't spoken with the players and he's not going to until tomorrow. Uh, I thought that was sort of a, uh, you know, a, a different tact maybe that he's taking and letting the players be the... Uh, you know, holding each other to accountable within the dressing room for some of the inconsistencies in the play there. And I do appreciate Sean Reynolds trying to get uh, to the bottom of that with that last question. But uh, Rick Bonus not taking the bait uh, in addressing it there, Dave. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, he couldn't have made it any more clear that he didn't want to be in that room. Let's put it that way. He was he was itching to go from like the minute he walked in there. But, uh, you know, he does have a responsibility to answer questions. And you know what? I mean, I. It's interesting that he's like it's. It's not state secrets here. He doesn't have to worry if if he he answers Sean's question in some capacity. But I guess he can doesn't have to be transparent. There's no obligations, and I guess we can figure it out ourselves, or we can spend an hour talking about it and trying to figure it out ourselves. But I mean, it's interesting that he said Nemestikov wasn't flu related. That he had been banged up. So you know that he's obviously dealing with something and. Uh, you know, I mean, it was interesting. Like I said, when when you saw Rasmus Kupari was the extra guy on the on the uh, ice for, well, not extra. I guess he was the the guy coming in for Mark Shifley in the sense that he was the extra body, right? And um, you know, the I guess, like I said, the Jets just didn't seem to be ready to go the way Nashville was, and that to yeah. me was was the story of this game. And I guess the secondary part of that drew would be that not only were they not ready to go right from puck drop, but the idea of the second period. And how poorly, I mean, you want to talk about Hellebuck. I, I agree that he is. Look, the first goal against is not a good goal, I don't think. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a save he typically makes. That's right. So I'm just saying. So he would normally, but that's why I'm saying with Connor Hellebuck, like 9.9 .9 times out of 10, he makes that save, I think. Yeah. The, the, the rest of them were, were, were more di uh, the varying degrees of difficulty. But my point is that they were outshot nine, but 19 to 7 in the second period. Mm -hmm. He killed two penalties. That's good. Right. But they just, they just, you know, you're down to nothing and your, your pushback is, is not, non non existent. And to me, that that's the biggest problem with this hockey game was just that you didn't have, you know, you can, you can say Nashville had, 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 it was ready to go from, from puck drop and you were um, discouraged without Mark Shifley and you just didn't have it, but you're only down to nothing. If you have a good second period, you cut the goal lead by, you know, Mason Appleton gets that puck to go. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a different situation, right? But the problem is you don't, and you don't, not only do you not have it, but they possess the puck, the almost the entirety of that period. Right. 
But look, I mean, and then the, then the third period, then we'll get into it in a second. So let's maybe hold that uh, as we get into the Betway game recap here. You know, look, this is game 65 for the Winnipeg Jets, and it's a bad loss in that, you know, the performance is not where you want it to be. It's not a, you know, not every loss is a, is a catastrophic defeat. And I, you yeah. know, even though the, this game was not what you want and you, I understand the feelings of disappointment and concern at the same time, I think the Winnipeg jets are still in a pretty good position. They're still in, you know, in, in, in a decent spot to probably, they should still be the favorite to win the central division based on, you know, the fact that they still have those couple games in hand and they're only two points behind the Dallas stars. So, so, you know, if you're going to struggle at this point in the season, you want to struggle now. You don't want to struggle in games 78, 79, 80, 81, and 82. You want to struggle in games 60, 63 through 67 so you can find your game so that the playoffs are, are – when the playoffs are rapidly approaching. That would be my comment about it. You don't like tonight's effort. You don't like, you know, a lot of the efforts as of recent against better teams, but at the same time – you know, you can find your way and work your way through this before it becomes, uh, you know, uh, a real serious, super serious level of concern, I would say. I mean, I just do think that there needs to be a little bit of you can't press the panic button on each and every loss. That's what I would say, yeah. uh, you know, to that effect. I and I know being... that some people are going to be accuse me of being easy on them. And yeah, sure. you, I'll take that criticism. That's fine. But at the same time, you know, the human element of these games, I really think, jumps out, especially when it's game. You know, this is the grind of the season right now. These games, you're confidently in a playoff spot. Mm. It's game 65. You're, you got a flu bug working through your team. And yes, these are, these sound like excuses. I get all that. It's just also the reality of humans playing hockey and not robots playing hockey. So you gotta. I do think you have to factor in the human element a little bit right now. That's all I would say to that effect. But at the same time, you can learn from these losses, and the Jets should learn from them. And I think that's what Rick Bonus was alluding to in his in his comments about you know going to look at it tomorrow. They'll have a good practice tomorrow, and they'll you know use it maybe try and use it as a building block or a learning lesson at this point in time. You know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I, I think you're being pragmatic. I don't think you're trying to wave the pom-poms here. That's not what we do on this show. No. And, we, you know, like I said, either way, the Jets played well. But, you know, sometimes when they play well, we point out, you know, some flaws. And when, when they lose, we point out, you know, some good things. It's it, it, uh, yin-yang on this show. And, and I think, look, I mean, at the end of the day, the team collectively cost themselves two points. And, you know, there's been a lot of instances where, you know, you could be the first place team in the central. You could have. I mean, they've had a lot of games that they've kind of pissed away sure. that for them, you know, those games in hand on Dallas, you know, I think, Drew, you like to say it, the games in hand are only to your advantage if you win. If no, you keep losing still, them, they, they, look, and I, I get it. I get it. They still have two games in hand. I understand. Yeah. They still have a game in hand on, on Colorado. I understand. But again, you know, and look, Dallas is going to, they're going to have a good chance to take out their frustrations on the Ducks on Friday. Mm -hmm. And I suspect it'll be a, a probably a bigger crowd a little more excitement on a friday night but i think that it's just one of those things to me at least like i said that you fans have a reason to be concerned right because you have a very good effort against seattle you have a terrible effort against vancouver mm -hmm. you have a very good effort against washington you mm -hmm. have a bad effort for the most part against nashville yeah. so it's it's an inconsistent team and look at the end of the day folks if this was last year's team probably would have lost three of the four so, I mean, like, again, this team is better than last year's team. That's not the same team as last year. There are some things that you don't like. Like I said, there's some things in this, in this team's game that needs to be cleaned up. Uh, and we'll talk about it throughout the course of this, the, as we break down the goals, because, you know, there's a lot of defensive breakdowns that we saw in this hockey game that led to good chances for, for Nashville and ended yeah. up in the back of the net. And it then was ultimately, a bad game. You know, I'm not, I, at no point in time am I saying that the Jets played well tonight because they didn't. That mm -hmm. would be delusional. As JB Brown drew, as JB Brown just wrote in our chat, I'm going to try and highlight it. You flush too many times, and it backs up. So, yeah, that's uh, fair. Also, you you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, that's also a valid comment. But look, Dallas blew a three nothing lead to Florida at home. I think that was last night, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. You know, 
it doesn't mean that Dallas is, is is a bad team all of a sudden. You know, pardon my French, but you know, in the course of an 82 game season, and 82 games is way too many games. I know it's never going to change. I've come to grips with that. But when you have 82 games, you can't play at the same level for all 82. And that's just the reality of it. Dallas is not a bad hockey team because they lost while tr- uh, despite having a 3-0 lead last night. Yes, that's Florida. Florida's a better team th- than than uh, the Nashville Predators. But guess what? The Predators, when you're feeling good... Guys, guys, first of all, the Predators are the hottest, one of the hottest teams, in the, if not the hottest team in the NHL. So, sure, they're not as good as the Panthers. We're not suggesting that. But they're right. literally one of... They pounded... They lost in 14 they, games. They they punt... <laughs> they, what did they beat Colorado 5-1 the other day? I mean, sure. I think or last week. I think it was on Thursday yeah. or, or Wednesday of last week. So, again, like you're not looking at Nashville... And saying this is a bad team that's beating bad teams, and oh, they beat the Jets, like they beat Colorado handily. I'll, I'm gonna go through. Drew, you keep talking. I'll, I'll look at who Nashville's, uh, who they're on their on their latest run, who they've managed to take out. But it, again, like I said, I don't think it's all bad Look, teams. I could be wrong, but you're but right. I'll check. It doesn't. It's not all bad teams. Look, there's there's again peaks and valleys throughout the course of an 82 game season. The Jets currently are in a bit of a valley. They'll try and come out of it. But again, this is a team that is firmly in a playoff spot. They don't frankly need to win game 65 that desperately. And when that's what, you know, all these teams, there's such a small gap between all these teams in the NHL because, it, you know, that's what parity is, is that there's not sizable differences between playoff teams. So, you know, usually the team that is, you know, clicking at, at, at the time is more likely to win the game or the team that is, you know, playing in a in the better mindset is going to is going to oftentimes win the game when there's that small of a talent disparity. So, yes, you be upset that the Jets lost. I get that. I get that and I understand that. But for perspective still matters. It still matters to have a little bit of perspective right now. And I no, that's all I'm I mean. Say. Drew, Drew being the voice of reason right now and, and having to like Drew's normally the fire and brimstone uh, right. bringer, but folks. No so, reason to be fire and brimstone. Right that's why my point is though that you're not yeah. I, I guess what I'm saying is if anybody is not gonna sugarcoat and try and pretend like the Jets are good when they're bad, it's Drew Mandel. Right. So like that's why I'm saying like people need if to relax. If I had serious concerns, I would say that there's serious yeah, concerns. That's what I mean. Like if anybody's gonna be like real talk, it's Drew, literally middle name. Real talk, Mendel. Actually, it's not literal, but the point is that I, I thank you, Drew. Yeah, I think that it's it's evident, and we'll go through it, guys. We're not gonna like not go through this and and break down this hockey game. We plan to. I think Drew's just trying to uh, suggest that it's not it's not time to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, and just start to trade this guy, trade this guy, and call this. Hire the coach. Mean, bring in Arneal. Bring up this guy. Bring down that guy. Yeah. It's game 65 of 82. They're firmly in a playoff spot. Really. And Andrea's right. There are serious concerns. Nobody's suggesting otherwise. You know, there, there are there are definitely elements of this team that you want to see uh, improved. And so, and again, like that's incumbent on them. That's not, we, we we have no impact on that one way or another. They they need to do that themselves. The coaching staff, that's why it's not just a, when the Jets lose, it's not just the Jets losing. It's the entire team, right? The coaching staff has to make better decisions. The players have to make better decisions. And ultimately, uh, that's what wins you hockey games in the NHL. Let's get into the Betway game recap on this Wednesday night. The Betway game recap. Big thanks to our friends at Betway for their continued support of the Illegal Curve post-game show. With a large selection of betting options and sports, as well as strong promotions and fair odds, what are you waiting for? Head on over to Betway and bet your way. Must be 19 years or older to play. Please play responsibly. So 4-2 was the final score in tonight's game. Let's talk about how we got there. The Predators opened the scoring uh, in the first period at the 638 mark. There were already signs in the course of this game that the Jets and their attention to detail was a little bit lacking. Gustav Nyquist getting his 18th of the year, a great pass from Roman Yossi, and anytime a goalie can get an assist, it's worth highlighting as well. UC Saros starts the play 
by making a simple little, uh, you know, not even an outlet pass, just sort of simply getting it onto the stick of Roman Yossi. And when it's on Roman Yossi's stick, good things happen. Nyquist gets behind Brendan Dillon. Brendan Dillon is unable to uh, stop the headman pass. Nyquist comes in, and as Dave alluded to, this is probably a goal Connor Hellebuck wants back. Nyquist beats him short side. Usually Hellebuck makes the save. It's a nice shot. It's a great pass by from Roman Yossi. Um, and the Predators have the one nothing lead at the 638 mark, Dave. Yeah, and, and you know, really the highlight and what really turned this play around was the pass by Roman Yossi, as you just illustrated, Drew. I mean, it was it was spectacular and I mean, he he really is worth the price of admission. If you live in Nashville, what a joy to watch that guy play hockey because he's, I mean, he's one of the best defensemen. Like his skating is phenomenal. His his abilities. It's amazing to watch him though because he plays like a forward. I can't tell you how many times in the t- course of today's hockey game we're like, oh, there's Roman Yossi leading the rush, or there's Roman Yossi at the Jets blue line. But you know what? Again, he he he's achieved what he's achieved uh, by his, by his, his skill. So, um, this was a Roman Yossi appreciation thought and you, you have to give it to him and look, Brendan Dillon tries to intercept the puck along the, uh, boards, but unfortunately, you know, that pinch forces yeah. now it, it's, it, it's an ill-advised one in my mind because yeah, I, I'm just saying like, to me, you know, you're, you're, you're trying, I understand what you're trying to do. And the truth was, at this point, Drew, the, the Jets had the the shot edge, right? They, after they gave up that initial sh- chance, they created a couple of opportunities themselves, including Mason Appleton right in front of UC Soros. And he made, mm-hmm. I mean, Appleton didn't get a ton on it. But, you know, you've got Dylan out with DeMello. And uh, not Dylan DeMello, but Dylan and DeMello are out there together. And like I said, he goes along the wall. He makes, he makes it, he, he takes a chance. Yeah. And if he, and, and the truth also is that if he intercepts it, you know, you've got, probably two Nashville guys back and you can get that, you can transition quick. The problem is if you don't yeah. and Yossi, I mean, and, um, and Nyquist does what he does, which is grab that puck. Now you've got a two on one. And so that's what ends up happening. And of all the goals that Connor Hellebuck gave up, this is the one I probably like the least. Right. Uh, and, and if you're Connor Hellebuck, you're probably happy that didn't turn out to be the game winning goal because <laughs> it would look like it was going to be for a while. Um, but yeah, I mean, you don't... I just don't love the decision there by Brendan Dillon. I mean, and Brendan no, Dillon, by the way, um, among a lot of Winnipeg Jets players, he he had a poor game tonight. And I mean, you know, we'll talk about it. And I think it was the third, uh, the third Predators goal, uh, might have been the fourth at this point in time. Uh, as we get through the the game recap, no, sure. it was the third Predators goal. I mean, you also don't like that play by Brendan Dillon. He did mm-hmm. not have a very good game for the Winnipeg Jets tonight, no. and you don't like. You just don't want a guy behind you at this point in time. And it was not the only time in the course of tonight's game that that happened, which speaks to the fact that the Jets didn't play well. I mean, at mm-hmm. no point in time am I saying that the Jets played a good game because they didn't. They played lousy. But, you know, it's going to happen in the course of an 82-game season is what I'm saying. And tonight was certainly one of those nights where the Nashville Predators were they were better, they were faster, they were stronger, and they wanted it more than the Winnipeg Jets did. And the Preds got off the start that they needed, getting that early one nothing goal uh, at the 638 mark. They make yeah, it so two like, nothing. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. So like we said, I mean, ultimately, you, you really want to pin this really. Brandon Dillon's decision to make that that pinch along the wall yeah. to try and intercept the puck. And then ultimately you don't like Connor. I, I mean, I personally don't like the way Connor Hellebuck plays that. And I think mm. he makes a save like almost 99 times out of a hundred, but that was, that was the one time out of a hundred that he didn't. And it puts his team behind the eight ball because you could feel Nashville was building a little bit of, uh, of momentum. Yeah. And they continue that momentum uh, a little more, a little less than eight minutes later, seven minutes and 54 seconds later, they make it two, two nothing. It's Kiefer Sherwood, his ninth of the year, assist again to Roman Yossi. And uh, I believe that's Craig Smith also getting, pardon me, Cole Smith, not, not mm-hmm. Craig, Craig Smith, the former Predators. This is Cole Smith, yeah. of, I believe, of the uh, formerly played for the MJHL Steinback Pistons. If I was going to say, he's a Manitoban. Yes, that's right. I apologize to the Smith family. Cole Smith getting his 14th assist on the year. And again, this is the Jets being too focused on Roman Yossi, and that's what he does. He garners attention. The Jets will not like. I think it was Perfetti and, if I'm not mistaken, Colin Miller. There's just too many guys focused on Yossi mm-hmm. and nobody focused on Kiefer Sherwood. And, and Yossi you know, gets the double team, uh, and there's an open man uh, in, in his place. You know, Guess what? You can double team in basketball. Uh, 
you, if you double team in, in hockey, it usually ends up uh, as a bit of a problem. In this case, it certainly was one as Sherwood makes it two nothing, his ninth of the year, and the Jets have, have had a pretty poor first period. Uh, you know, from Nashville, uh, you know, with Nashville getting the early two nothing lead. Well, I'd love to know why four Jets are covering two Predators. I it's mean, too it's, many players. It's, it's uh, just, hang on. again, you're, yeah, you're doing the mathematics and you're going, wait, wait, one. No, no, that's too much. That's yeah. it just doesn't, it doesn't equate. And it, you know, you're, you're again, the predators have a big advantage because all your guys are deep. And so anybody who's trailing has the, the, the chance, uh, uh, you know, a very good chance because they're basically allowed to walk down main street. Now, thankfully they're walking down main street, not driving. Cause if they were driving, they'd probably blow a tire in one of the potholes. Because they're so bad right now in the city, but Drew, that's an aside. That's not something yes. we're supposed to talk about right now. Probably more of a post post commercial break. I'll I'll rail about the potholes in the city. But anyways, you know what? It, it's just it. Yeah, you don't like the way that those guys like it. again. If you're gonna let Sandberg play back, but even even in this in this situation, right? Kupari falls. Perfetti and Baron are getting back into the play, and really, if I'm, per- it's just bad decision making because Perfetti and Sandberg both go for the same player. Well, wait a second. That doesn't make any sense. One of you needs to be there, not both. And instead, both guys go there to cover Yossi. And I, 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 like you said, Drew, he's the kind of player that, you know, merits a lot of attention. But ultimately, like, you can't have two guys leaving the middle of the ice wide open. And then McCarron's in front. He's a big boy, but you only need one defenseman to cover him, really. Yeah. And Kiefer Sherwood, who... Again, folks who follow the Manitoba Moose watched him play for the Milwaukee Admirals. I don't. I think he played like forty-five games. I want to say, and he scored a lot. He had like over twenty goals for Milwaukee last year. He's a good young player. And again, that was one thing we saw. Remember that run that Nashville went on that almost cost the Jets a playoff spot last year. Mm-hmm. That's because a lot of their Milwaukee Admirals got a chance to get some NHL experience last year in that final kind of whatever it was, 10, 15 games of the year. That kind of. Uh, really augmented what that team was able to do. And you're seeing the benefit of it because a guy like Kiefer Sherwood, who now has what nine, 10 goals on the season, he scores an absolute beauty. And and unfortunately for, you could say that, I don't know, I don't know if folks are, are upset with Connor Hellebuck on this one, but I mean, it's pretty difficult just the way the no, team, okay. I, I just didn't like the way the just jets defended. Right. Cause like I said, you got, it's a it, Colin Miller and Morgan Barron are both on the same are on McCarron. Right. And we right. already went through Perfetti and, and Sandberg. So, I mean, you've got four of your players on two of theirs. Well, again, like I said, do the math. It leaves a guy like he for sure would open and he rips that home. And I think if I recall correctly, I think Hellebuck was a little bit screened by Miller on the, on, on the shot. I could be wrong, but I think Miller kind of ultimately ended up for, for creating a bit of a screen on Hellebuck. So, you know, it's just, uh, it was kind of a, it was just a badly played uh, a sequence by Winnipeg and it ends up a two nothing lead for Nashville. Yeah. And that's how the first period ended, 2 nothing. The second period uh, was just a, a catastrophe for the Winnipeg Jets. And if it wasn't for Connor Hellebuck and some uh, quality penalty killing as the Jets took two minor penalties, it likely would have been even more out of hand. The, no goals scored in that second period. Uh, the PK was really effective for the Winnipeg Jets. The Predators have 19 shots on goal in that second period to the Jets' seven. So with a complete lack of a response, lack of a bounce back by the Jets uh, in the in the middle frame is is troubling and is certainly uh, one of the litany of concerning aspects of tonight's contest. Uh, the third period begins and Sportsnet was rightfully so talking up the Jets in their third period and their performance come third period as of late and how effective they've been in battling back. Well, there was no battle back from the Winnipeg Jets tonight. Uh, Nashville scores a minute 29 into the third period. It's Philip Forsberg. He gets his 34th of the season assist to Nyquist so and Ryan McDonough. And again, it's just a just a comedy of errors here. Brendan Dillon is trying to do something with the flipped puck. The puck is flipped into the jet zone. He's backpedaling or skating backwards and he's trying to either knock it down and play it or knock it into the corner 
he doesn't do anything of any good <laughs> either way. He, you know, even leaving it for Connor Hellebuck would have been the better of the three options in this mm-hmm. case. Instead, he knocks it down. It ends up really right on the stick of Nyquist and Nyquist with a beautiful drop pass and Forsberg walks in and just absolutely rips it past Connor Hellebuck. And you could just one of those nights as really best exemplified by this uh, really horrible play by, by Brendan Dillon and just, you know, the jets having no, just nobody covering for one another, just all they're just sort of staring at each other as to what the hell just happened. And that's exactly what the jets had on this play. Well, and you got to give Nyquist a lot of credit because he, you know, he really got Hellebuck to bite and, and pulled Hellebuck to the Hellebuck's right which left that that net wide open for sure. uh, Forsberg. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, again, it's a second questionable decision by Brendan Dillon uh, mm-hmm. that leads to a goal against. And, you know, it's one thing if he pops it over to the left or pops it out of a danger area, but instead of, like, does it pop, not only does he not, does he pop it up, he has no idea where it is. That's right. He, like, I mean, he, you know, exactly. There's just everything about it. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, make Brendan Dillon out to be the bad guy or the sole reason the Jets lost this game. No, no, of that's course. Certainly not. not the case. But again, when you, when you sort of have brain fog and the Jets played the entire game as if they had some brain fog, and I'm not using brain fog in any sort of clinical use of the term, I'm just mm-hmm. saying that they weren't sharp and they weren't really it just seemed like they, they their decision making was slow all game long it's just another one of these plays if you're on it you probably know what you're doing with that puck you're either yeah. leaving it for hellebuck or you have a game plan and you're putting it into the corner and it's out of trouble instead when you're playing as if you're you know you got that fog you know it, it ends up right in the middle of the ice and you don't know where it is and it's just keystone cop style well, and, and again, it's also, if you think about it, this is another instance, though, where a, an un, unforced error at as you're trying to exit the zone results in a turnover, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they get the, they try to get the puck up to Kyle Connor along the wall. He's unable to handle the pass. I mean, it's a chip, but still, he is unable to handle it. Roman Yossi, no surprise, being aggressive at the blue line. And then Nashville, while the Jets are, are doing a line change, counterattack. Because they're like, well, we're not, we don't have to wait for you. We right. we're going. And so they, what do they do? They keep pressing and you credit them because like, you know, you're sitting there and you're going, well, wait, wait, like, similar to the second period. And, you know, look, the fact of the matter is it's only two, nothing down. It's the right. third period, which we've talked about. And you just mentioned the, the a very good period for the Winnipeg Jets. So you're like, okay, you're only down to nothing, but it's Nashville who's, who's, who's attacking and who has that attack mentality. Right. And they're the ones who are the aggressors. And, and as a result, they get rewarded. A mistake ends up in your back of your net. And if three nothing drew, we're saying it's over. I mean, I was going to tweet out saying if folks yeah, want to start over. the illegal game post game show, we could start it now because it was, uh, it, yeah. you know, it's funny. They talked about, um, I was listening because, of course, I left after the second period from the from Canada Life to come home to listen to my possessed TV because I don't know what the hell was going on. I'm curious as to the chat because I know Drew said he didn't hear it when we were talking pregame. Did anybody else hear that weird sound coming through their television? Because it sounded like I heard people tell me it sounded like a, a barking seal, a woman talking. It just sounded very unusual. Like the ice mics were somewhere. I, I don't know what it was, but it like it was very distracting. Like I'm watching the game and all of a sudden I hear something. I'm like, what is going on? So that was that was my sports net experience in the third period. But uh, I think it glad was, I was don't blame sports on this one. I, I think it was your TV thing. I think no, because TV. what do you mean? Why would it be my TV? Everybody drew. Clearly, other people had that experience. So, see, there we go. Tracy's I saying the same I thing. Know. I have yes. no idea. Other Tree, G, it. Yes. Tree G is saying, yes, it was annoying. So, there you go. There, there's a, but I'm just saying. So, you know, the, um, I was going to say something about the broadcast because I was listening to Kelly and uh, Christian and Mel talk in the in the second intermission about something, but then I got then I got sidetracked by my own uh, by my own thoughts about the uh, oh, the idea was that you know when the Carolina they did did this to Carolina right that you know they they were able to come back they're down three nothing to Carolina the difference right. is Yuzi Saros is not Kachekov and so he's a you know a much better goaltender and and the other thing also was the Jets were not until the till the end of the game. They were not hitting him with high danger shots. I mean, the shots were from from far away. The Jets yeah, and he's, didn't play well. I mean, he, you're not you're not bleeding. You're not beating Uzi Saros from 20, 30 feet out. Sorry, no. You know, you're these not. In, ineffective shots from the point, like even on the power play, without a screen, guys. Come on, what are we trying here? You're, you're not you're not you're not gonna you're not gonna beat a guy like Uzi Saros uh, like that. So 
Um, it was just not one of those. It was not going to be when they made it three nothing, and shortly thereafter, we know what happened. But once it was three nothing, it was over rock. Yeah, and then they made it four nothing. Twenty two seconds later, Jason Zucker getting his first as a member of the Nashville Predators assist to Colton Sissons, and and again, you know, Pionk and Dylan are on the ice, you know, uh, on this one. And again, you you've let Predators players behind you, and yeah. you're just watching guys. And you know, Hellebuck makes the save. And they're just, you know, Zucker's just standing there and it's just, mm-hmm. fifi, you know, unaccosted, just, you know, easy rebound to tuck it past Hellebuck. I, you know, just defensive breakdown after defensive breakdown in tonight's game for the Winnipeg Jets. Just the, you know, the attention to detail was just not there at all. And, and the Predators had a free pass to get to where the it used to be earlier in this year where the Jets didn't let opponents go. Like the Jets didn't let the opponents go to the front of the net against Seattle last Friday. And the Jets didn't let you know the Capitals go in front of the net on Monday against the, uh, you know, uh, on Monday between when they played the Capitals. So, mm-hmm. I mean, tonight they let them go there. On Saturday night, they let Vancouver go there. So that's what Rick Bonus and that's what the players and that's what the coaching staff needs to figure out is why why was why did you were you so loose in front tonight and why were you so loose in front on saturday when 48 hours ago you weren't that loose and yeah nashville's a better team than washington and yeah nashville and vancouver are better teams than seattle and washington but you got to find a way to uh consistently play that style that you you that you did play so consistently earlier in the year and that's where the jets have been lacking as of late yeah and look it starts by three guys being deep right Ehlers, nemesnikov and uh was it ifalo uh, are yeah, it was IFL. and are all deep but the crazy thing is they actually get back in time and then the problem is neil pionk and brendan dillon are doing who knows what in front of connor hellebuck because neither guy is in position to take a man they're basically just standing there like pylons they, they don't do anything so, I mean, yeah, it was definitely not the best game by Brendan Dillon, uh, nor probably the best game by Neil Pionk, but no. it, it's it's just unfortunate because they, you know, I, look, even if you're not going to win that hockey game, you know, to give up a second goal in such close proximity to the, the third goal is is just bad form because it's just, again, it you know, the word that people were using in the chat is, where's the heart? Right. Even if you're not going to win, people want to see you working hard. People want to see that that effort is there. Because that's the thing with, 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 I look, Drew, you can say you can't have effort every game. You can't have effort every game. You can't win every game, but you have to have that effort. You have to be able to see that, you know, easy mistakes. Look, Nashville, I, I, I applaud Nashville because they didn't sit back on a two goal lead. Right. And, and they and well, probably Nashville in, saw a, 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 an opponent that wasn't interested in pushing back. So they might as well keep playing the way they want to play. It's not like the Jets, it's not like the Jets made it difficult on Nashville. The no, Jets did exactly. it. They made it easy on Nashville. So yeah. Nashville's like, sure, we'll just keep doing what we've done since face since the puck drop. Yeah. You know, and that's what, you know, Nashville played the same game for all 60 minutes. And the Jets, unfortunately for the Jets, they played the same game for all 60 minutes. It was just a shitty game that they played for all 60 minutes. <laughs> well, look, two goals within the first two minutes of the third period is just not acceptable. Right, you're in a game. Yeah. You're trailing two nothing. That's, That's right. what it comes down to. And so, you know, it, again, you have aspirations to be like you're allowed to lose hockey games, right? Like the the nobody thinks the Colorado Avalanche still aren't a Stanley Cup contender because they lost to Nashville last week five to one. Mm-hmm. And so teams can lose, and you can have poor games, and you have to. I guess the most important thing, and I and I know what the fans are saying, is that you want to be able to see that the team is learning from the mistakes and not repeating those mistakes. And so. You know, and it's one thing uh, Paul Friesen was asking Rick Bonus about today was that idea of consistency, right? Because to the idea that, and it's it's interesting because it, it, this, this is prior to the game happening, of course, but, you know, you he's saying, and we've talked about it in our preamble, you got Friday's game against Seattle, phenomenal effort. Nobody's questioning. Jets are the Stanley Cup champions. They lose, this, they lose to the Canucks on Saturday. They're the worst team ever. Sell everybody. They defeat Washington. Okay, they're a good team. And now you're back to, well, they they they, they lose to uh, Nashville and they're terrible. But it's that idea of consistency and and how, now, again, how much of this is missing Mark Shifley? Well, that's, again, that's a big factor. But again, like I said, what it ultimately comes down to is uh, you're just, it's not acceptable when you've given up those 
the way they played in that third to start that third period. The second period wasn't a good period, obviously. And now you started and you're, you're behind it behind the eight ball. And at this point, really at this point, all we're wondering is, are you going to break the shutout and what the aggregate score is between the jets and the, and the predators and the moose and the um, admirals, because of course, six, nothing. And now it's four, nothing. So yeah. is I'm it going to sure be the aggregate score ultimately matters for anything, but you're right about that. Yeah. So yeah. Jets get on the board, Alex Iafalo getting his 10th of the year, that coming at the 13-12 mark. A nice tip of a Brendan Dillon shot, Vlad Nemesnikov with the secondary assist. Hell, hell why not? Let's call it our Seagram shot of the game. The Seagram shot of the game. Big thanks to our friends at Seagram's. They continue to support the Illegal Curve post-game show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk with you. Our encouragement would be that you choose a fine Seagram's product when you're looking to for something to drink. Perhaps you want Seagram's 83, Manitoba's number one whiskey. Available where all fine liquor products are sold. Please consume your Seagram's products responsibly. That broke the shutout. That made it 4-1, That thus uh, ruining my narrative of every every single game from now on for the Jets is either going to be a team victory by shutout or a team defeat by That would be shutout. quite the, yeah. you know, y- you know uh, yin and yang. Uh, yeah, unbelievable. If you could go win-lose, win-lose versus uh, with the shutout. Yeah. That would certainly be the case. Unfortunately, it is not going to be the case. The Jets break the shutout, and then Mason Appleton with 11 seconds to go on the power play, getting his 11th of the year assist to Colin Miller. That's his first point as a member of the Winnipeg Jets and Dylan Samberg. Appleton, uh, I thought, was one of the better Jets forwards again Mm -hmm. tonight. I mean, he's got... You know, yes, he's got 11 goals. Doesn't really have the softest hands in the NHL, I think is the polite way of putting that. He doesn't have the best goal scoring touch. But again, for probably either maybe the second or third straight night, I thought he's been one of the most noticeable Winnipeg Jets forwards. So kudos to Mason Appleton uh, for being the best of a relatively bad bunch uh, in tonight's contest for the Winnipeg Jets. They do drop the game by a 4-2 margin. They're next in action on Friday, playing the woeful Anaheim Ducks, a game that the Jets would expect and I think fans would expect them to have a better response to than tonight's uh, lame performance on home ice as the Nashville Predators keep their good times rolling. Winners of or having not lost in 13 consecutive games, lost in regulation, that is, in 13 consecutive games, 11-0-2 now on the season, the Nashville Predators are. Quick look at the out-of-town scoreboard. Late, late in the first period, the Colorado Avalanche, they're in Vancouver, and they are currently trailing the Canucks, a Canucks team minus Thatcher Demko. They are trailing the Canucks 2-0 late in the first period in Vancouver as we take a quick glance at relevant scores involving the Winnipeg Jets. The only other game right now, Edmonton up 3-2 on Washington, that in the first intermission. Earlier tonight, the Blues beat the Kings by a 3-1 margin in St. Louis. Louis not going away. Well, beat, uh, they beat Boston. Now they're, I mean, look, they, unfortunately for them now, well, you never know. Hey, there could be five from the central. If, uh, if LA and Vegas keep losing Vegas, that's true. remember drew Vegas last night, I think they scored with 13 seconds to go, uh, to tie the game. Otherwise they would have lost again. So yeah. uh, Vegas and LA not doing themselves any favors. Uh, so I, I, I mean, I, I can see, I see Vegas going on a run. I don't see LA going on a run. No, I neither do I. So I'm just saying it's not yeah. inconceivable. As they said in the Princess Bride, to see that one of these hard-charging central teams, even Minnesota, I know folks around uh, here don't love the Minnesota Wild, but even the Minnesota Wild, who have been who beat these Nashville Predators with a very ballsy uh, pull the goalie in overtime, yeah, which would have lost them all their points had they had Nashville scored, but ends up winning them the game. You know, Minnesota's charging, St. Louis is charging. They're not going to catch Nashville. But I, like I said, it's possible that they could, if LA keeps, you know, pooping the bed and uh, Vegas does as well, never say never. That's all I'm saying, Drew. That's why the NHL got the standings the way they've got it. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it never. goes down to the, well, we'll see. I'm That's why they play never. the game, Drew. 
That is why they play the game, and that's why we do the post-game show as well. This is the Illegal Curve post-game show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk with you on this Wednesday evening. When we come back, we will do the Tough Duck Hardest Hitting Comment. The Manuk Moose Minute, which certainly was a better that's time an than tonight's game. Yeah, than tonight's you want to be uplifted, folks. Six goals to talk about. Yeah, please don't talk about all six goals. Every please. single I'm one. Begging, I'm begging you. One. I'm begging you on my hands and knees to not talk about all six goals. But we will talk about it next. You're watching the Legal Curve post game show, Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk, on this Wednesday evening. BP's new New York Sicilian Square Footers. With a thicker crust than ever before, they're light and airy on the inside and oh so crispy on the outside. You're going to have your work cut out for you. Uh, okay, fine. Try the New York Sicilian Square Footers, only at Boston Pizza. You guys ever wish for a game changer in life? Like finding out your favorite snack has zero calories? Or discovering the mute button on Ezzy? Picture this, a secret weapon for parking, where you can book a spot a whole month in advance. Tell me more, Drew. Pre-book your parking at really low rates, or maybe even for free, if you use the code Illegal Curve. <laughs> free? What is this, sorcery? The Grid Park app. It's a real secret weapon that has affordable game day parking, and to sweeten the deal even more... I love sweets. Our listeners can use the code illegal curve to park for free. Holy Zamboni. Tell me about it. Just download Grid Park, G R Y D Park, and use the code illegal curve, all one word, to park for free. The game can change ah! just like that. Accidents happen when you aren't protected. So now what? Getting to your injury quickly can make all the difference. Help prevent them from being game changers with Linden Market Dental Center. Bonding, crowns, bridges, and dental implants. State-of-the-art treatments are available to help you get back in the game. To learn more, visit LindenMarketDentalCenter.com. Creating smiles for life. Your coworkers love you because you always make them laugh. You're the life of the party with stories that have them rolling on the floor. Or maybe you're just the quiet one in the corner with the one-liners that just slay. Do you have what it takes to become Winnipeg's funniest person with a day job? Try your luck. Hit the stage at Rumors Comedy Club, and you could be walking away with $1,000 cash. Winnipeg's funniest person with a day job. Presented by Rumors. For all the details, head to RumorsComedyClub.com. Whoa, Ezzy, everything okay? You look stressed. Of course I'm stressed. We're moving, the house is upside down, the kids failed miserably at packing the fine china, and my life is in chaos. Chaos! Yes, that does sound like a problem. What am I going to do? Ezzy, relax. Rolly's transfer moving and storage is the answer. With 60 years of experience in moving Manitobans and a track record of exemplary customer service, one call to Rollies and your stress is gone. No job is too big or too small. Just visit Rollies.com and they will take it from there. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Rollies Transfer Moving and Storage, online at Rollies.com. For three generations and over 80 years, Tough Duck has been making apparel that works and plays as hard as the people who wear it. From jackets to work boots and everything in between, Tough Duck's clothing can handle the harshest environments, even the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Work to live, live to play. Visit toughduck.com. Ten fifteen Wednesday evening. Welcome back to the Illegal Curve post game show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk, with you talking about the Jets' four two defeat at the hands of the Nashville Predators, a score that flatters the Jets as it was four nothing early in the third period, and anything after that was simply window dressing by a Winnipeg Jets team that certainly did not have the effort and performance tonight that they that they would have hoped for. Uh, the Jets next in action, of course, Friday against the Anaheim Ducks as their uh, routine of going against non-playoff teams and playoff <laughs> teams and non-playoff teams uh, continues, although I guess it'll end on Sunday when they face the Blue Jackets uh, after they face the Ducks on Friday. So a couple of relatively, uh, a couple games against lesser opponents upcoming for the Winnipeg Jets. and they have Opportunity knocketh, Drew. 
yes, they've been good in those games. So we'll see if they can continue that on Friday and then on Sunday against the Preds. The Jets farm team was very good earlier today in Milwaukee against the Admirals. Dave M will get you all up to date on that. It's the Manuk Moose Minute. Put on your antlers. It's time for the Manuk Moose Minute on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. I've been advised reliably that if I want a host for a Friday show that I shouldn't be droning on and on and on and on about the six goals. Tired and, uh, I'm tired and a little grumpy is all. So uh, you, know, <laughs> you don't want curmudgeonly Drew to come out right now. because Aren't you always curmudgeonly Drew? I'm not always curmudgeonly Drew. I'm just right now, this moment, I'm just like, it's one of those instances where everything and everyone is annoying me. So I think I should ah. just sort of be by myself and hibernate sure. for a little while. Okay, well then don't then if you don't want any joy in Joyland, then don't listen to this next little segment because okay. the moose were up. I, I thought you were just gonna mute yourself or just remove yourself from the screen stream, but oh there he goes. There he is done. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, now you put me to the other side. But look, the moose uh, had a critical game against Milwaukee. They split their they started off the six-game road trip with a win in Milwaukee. They split their uh, two games set in Iowa this past weekend and so they're in milwaukee this morning for a school day game they'll be doing one of those in winnipeg next tuesday at 10 30 a.m we'll have tickets to give away for that probably do it this weekend but the moose had a critical game against milwaukee before they go into chicago uh for two more games friday saturday to conclude this six games but this as i talked about with some of the folks in the moose this was really going to be critical for them to make a playoff push all divisional opponents see what they were going to be made of uh, henry nickinen and daniel torgerson came back into the lineup Thomas Milich got the net, and he was going to need to be good because the Moose, much like the Jets, didn't exactly start on time. They got outshot 8-1, to one, and Thomas Milich was excellent uh, up to the task, as I as I put it earlier. A couple of instant, interesting things happened to him. He got his, his feet taken out in the blue paint, Drew, and then as he was discussing it with the ref during the next whistle, for some reason, the linesman not paying attention. Maybe it's all the maybe it's the thousands of screaming kids. I, I saw that. I saw that video. It's on your Twitter feed in case people haven't seen it. I'm like, what the hell did I just watch? Yeah, yeah. So basically, Milich is talking to the ref, and you can see them at the bottom of the screen. He's nowhere <laughs> near his net, though. So the moose net is wide open. And for some reason, the linesman calls everybody in. And you can see one of the, the admirals players kind of looks over and goes, they, they don't even have a goalie right now, but they still drop the puck. It, it was more of a, a kind of a funny thing than anything significant. But anyways, the uh, Moose needed Thomas Millich to be excellent in that first uh, six minutes of the game. He was, and it proved uh, fortuitous because then Manitoba started to push back. And uh, it started off with a nice play by Ville Hainola to keep a puck in an Admiral's uh, zone. He passes it over to Simon Lodmark, who blasts it home. Great. You want to talk about screens? Nicholas Jones. See, it's funny. I often say, Drew, the guys who do the screen, the heavy, the hard work in front, they don't get assists. They don't get, they don't really get anything. We don't really talk about plus minus, but Nicholas Jones does all the hard work for Simon Lundmark and uh, the Moose have a one nothing lead. And they ended the first period with a 16 2 shot edge after being down, like I said, 8 1. So that was pretty good for Manitoba to take one nothing lead into this first intermission. And then they just kept rolling. Christian Reichel. This, we call them the identity line. This is from Kyle Capo Bianco because he said they're the identity of this team, the line of Jeffrey VL, Christian Reichel, and Parker Ford. And with good reason, the identity lines got things going. So Christian Reichel, he scored his 15th of the year, which is pretty remarkable because he went, I want to say like 20 or 30 games without scoring a goal. So maybe not 30, but 20 games, I think, without scoring. So he's been rolling. That made it 2 nothing, And then uh, nice transition by the Moose. It's funny because the Moose actually were the opposite of the Jets today. They were they were the aggressor. They were the more aggressive team. And uh, Brad Lambert fed Jeff Malott, who uh, scores to make it a 3 nothing game. And he ties Lambert with 18 goals. So that's with the ties Lambert for the Moose lead. And that assist uh, puts Lambert into third spot among, amongst AHL rookies for scoring. I think that's his... Uh, I want to say it's his 41st point. And so then uh, they weren't done there, Drew. I know you're worried. They weren't done there. Christian <laughs> Reichel tips home a Jeffrey Vial shot. I think Dimitri Kuzman got him the puck. So he's been playing the 2021 third rounder for the Jets. He's been playing much better uh, with, I know Tico Napoli is not going to be happy, but Tyrell Bauer out because he's got a back issue. And so uh, Dimitri Kuzman, he picks up the assist after uh, gets the puck over to Vial. Vial blasts it home and Reichel tips it. So they've got... Three goals in that second period, Drew, but they weren't done there. The Moose, I almost said the Manukes, the Moose 
kept I'm great, sure, actually kept, I hear rumor rumors of a foot that they're <laughs> willing to change the name of the team from the Manitoba Moose to the Manitoba Manukes. That's well, there's rumors that bubbling under the surface that that might happen, <laughs> or at least at the very least, maybe a special jersey night where they uh, they come out wearing you know a Manuk themed jersey. I think that would be good. It's just got a fireplace behind them and a backwards hat. The Moose is wearing a backwards hat with a fireplace <laughs> behind them. Fair enough. That'd be okay. I'd be okay with that. But anyways, the Moose, uh, you know, kept going in that uh, third period. And Henry Nickenen, who was, sna- speaking of snake bit, he definitely didn't score for 35 games. He got his third real nice four check by Daniel Torgas in the 2020 second rounder, I want to say. I'm thinking that's right, but I'm not 100% certain. But yeah, 2020 second rounder. And so then it was 5 nothing. Uh, it was just really a question of shutout watch. And Millage made some beautiful saves. In fact, Kyle Capobianco gave the puck away, setting up a shorthanded opportunity. But Millage made another real nice save. And then Parker Ford rounded out the scoring with his, uh, hmm, I want to say his 10th or 11, no, maybe his 11th goal. And so um, he made a nice play where the puck basically, he found some soft ice all alone in front of. And they actually, um, after the fourth goal, they actually uh, chased Yaroslav Askarov, the first rounder of Nashville, from the net. And so uh, Parker Ford made it a 6 nothing game, and the Moose would uh, would hold for that final score. So uh, Mil- Thomas Millich, he improves the 9-5-1, making 29 saves on 29 shots. And the Moose move up three points on the Wolves for the fifth and final playoff spot in the Central. And like I said earlier, conveniently, they play now the Wolves for two games in Chicago. So it'll be real curious to see what happens because if the team can go for a sweep, they really pretty much assure themselves a, a playoff spot. If the Wolves do the sweep, well, then they're out. Or if they are in a split, they're even. There you go. Dave M, as he only he can do with the Manuk Moose Minute. Congratulations, Thomas Millett. That's his first AHL shutout. Did he sure. have one uh, in the ECHL? I honestly don't know. Uh, you're usually the potpourri guy, you know, where's some potpourri. Oh, hold I on. I don't know if it's his first professional shutout or his first, only his, his first age. Well, shutout. I'm pretty sure he had one in the CHL. I'm, I feel like someone will have my back. Maybe, maybe, uh, Joe from Winnipeg, but I, speaking of shutouts, Drew. Oh boy. And you mentioned potpourri. Uh, here it comes. And you offered this as an opportunity. So we talk I about regret everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think folks will like this though. I just thought it was curious, although I, I will qualify it. I will make, I will start with a disclaimer saying that, yes, I'm very aware that the era Connor Hellebuck is currently in is vastly different from the era from 1979 to 1996. So with that being said, with that understanding out there, I just thought it was curious. Speaking of shutouts, Connor Hellebuck picked up his 36th shutout of his career when they defeated the Washington Capitals on Monday, right? Monday. And so someone asked us on our Instagram, which we're actually live on right now, yes. that someone asked us that um, what was the most shutouts uh, aside from Connor Hellebuck for a Winnipeg goalie. So I looked, Andre Pavlik had 11 for the Jets. He had 17 total, but six of those were from Atlanta. And then I went and looked at the Jets 1.0 and the number one goalie was, no surprise, Bobby Essenza. Great save, Essenza. So that was not a surprise. He had 14. But the drop-off from Essenza to the next goalie was the bandit, Daniel Berthume. He only had four. So then I was looking, I was looking at the numbers and I started doing, brought up my abacus and I started doing some math. And I realized that 36 shutouts for Connor Hellebuck equaled all the shutouts achieved by Winnipeg Jets 1.0 goalies. So I just thought that was a rather curious thing. And Connor Hellebuck did it in 492 games. They did it in 1,192 games. So again, some interesting symmetry there. 700 games fewer. Again, with the qualifier that I understand, very different eras. In this mm. year, this 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 go around than it was in the 80s and 90s. However, as I wrote in the original tweet, it was a fun fact, and that's all it was supposed to be. That is very well done. That is undoubtedly a fun fact indeed. Quick little uh, story before we wrap up. My parents were texting me earlier. They're down south as they they like to winter uh, in the southern United States, and they were waiting in line for an appointment, and they got to uh, chatting. My dad, in particular, gets to chatting with some the person who's sitting next to him. My mm-hmm. dad... Oh, uh, I drew that. Just right to interrupt you, but there's the answer. I knew Joe from Winnipeg. Normal. No? Thank you, there Joe you from Winnipeg. Uh, so he's chatting with this individual, doesn't know this guy, and they're talking, and he mentions you know that I do this show, and that we do Illegal Curve, and the post-game show, and the website, and 
the Saturday show and everything. And the guy, you know, okay, they finish the conversation. The guy says he's going to check it out and he's going to tune in tonight, whether or not he did or didn't. I, I, I would be surprised if he actually did. Turns out the guy they were talking to is one of the minority owners of the Vegas Golden Knights. So there you go. <laughs> How's that for a little bit of a, a random run in uh, that I figured I might as well end it on a high note. They've been a little bit grumpy today, but we'll end it with a little bit of a quick chuckle tonight uh, for courtesy of my folks uh, down so, south. And as Spence, he knows, yeah, firsthand, Sheldon Mandel is definitely a chatter. So, just to be just to be confirmed. So next week when we're doing this at Hakkasan in Vegas, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. where they're flying us out there. <laughs> that's exactly okay. what's happening. They're flying us to Vegas to do the show. We're gonna we're all of a sudden going to do a quick pivot and become a Vegas Golden Knights post game show before you guys even that's our heel turn. Clue what the hell happened? Exactly. It's like why are they covering the Golden Knights all of a sudden? <laughs> and Spencey's uh, like back. Spencey's gonna be like, what is this Golden Knights lunch? We'll be like, that's exactly what it is, Spencey. <laughs> and you're exactly. gonna like they it. They wrote the biggest check. Tough duck hardest hitting comment. The Tuck Duck Hardison Comment. Big thanks to all of you for chatting. Big thanks for all of you tuning in. Tonight's hardest hitting comment goes to Tree G. Top two players out, two new players who have not been able to practice with the team. Predators wanted it more. All three statements there are pretty damn accurate and really do a good job in providing a synopsis of tonight's contest between the Jets and the Predators. The Jets, shorthanded, not necessarily in terms of the penalty kill uh, concept, but shorthanded in terms of no Velarde, no Shifley, not enough practice time yet to uh, acclimatize to Foley and Miller, and the Nashville Predators wanted it more than the Winnipeg Jets. Tree G, slide into my DMs at IC Drew, or email me, Drew, at IllegalCurve.com, and we'll hook you up with a toque, courtesy of our friends at Tough Duck, proud supporters of the Illegal Curve post-game show. That's it for this Wednesday night. Jets lose 4-2 to the Predators. If you haven't already done so, smash the like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the podcast, and leave us feedback, particularly if you're wondering why I'm such a grumpy Gus sometimes. Uh, we'll be back on, wet on Friday night after the Jets and the Anaheim Ducks. In the interim, everything related to the Winnipeg Jets and the Manitoba Moose is available on our website, Illegal Curve. Dot com. That's where you can find everything as well as on our YouTube channel. Big thanks to all of our sponsors. That is our friends at Farmery Beer, Rolly's Transfer, Seagram's, Boston Pizza, Tough Duck, Betway, Zapia Group Realty, Linden Market Dental Center, Grid Park, use code illegal curve to park for free, and Rumors Restaurant and Comedy Club. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Go ahead, Dave M. Some late breaking news. We may have some giveaways for uh, parking from our friends at Grid Park. I, I made a suggestion. So we may have some giveaways for those who want to park for free, courtesy of our friends at Grid Park for the remaining home games. So stay tuned for that. Hopefully, I'll have some more information that might be available on illegalcurve.com or via our Twitter for Friday's home game. We'll see if we can make something happen. So you can park for free, get comfortable using the Grid Park app. There you go. Big thanks to our friends at Grid Park for their continued support of the Illegal Curve post-game show. Thanks for all of you for joining us. We'll be back Friday night right around 9.40, 9.45. Give or take a couple of minutes. We will see you then. Thanks, everyone, for joining us until Friday night. We wish you good night and good luck. And thanks for joining us on the Illegal Curve post-game show.